Top Med Talk. Welcome to Top Med Talk. This is part one of a two-part piece. In today's podcast, we're going to be summarising some of the big Top Med Talk pieces of 2022, all of which are linked to in the show notes. In the second part, we'll be looking back and looking forward to 2023. Coming up, we've got a look at the Perioptive Diabetes Management Podcast. Also, the Transatlantic Leadership Forum, Connected Health, COVID, Hyperdrive or Hype. And also, is Day Case Total Knee Replacement taking enhanced recovery after surgery too far? And nutrition clinics. But first, one of the most downloaded podcasts of the year in 2022 was a deep dive into intraoperative hypotension. It's been a huge subject here on Top Med Talk across the years, and this is likely one of the reasons it had so much attention from the listeners. The podcast is called Key Update on Intraoperative Hypotension at POM Chicago. It's presented by Desiree Chapel and Monty Mython with their guests, Thomas Sheeran, Professor of Anesthesiology at University Medical Center in the Netherlands, and Ashish Khan, Associate Professor, the Department of Anesthesiology, Wake Forest School of Medicine. We've spent a lot of time talking about the fact that hypotension is bad. I really do feel that we need to move on to the next step and, and intervene and talk about how to prevent hypotension. With reference to three papers, which Ashish is named upon, the discussion moves around where we are with hypertension. I want to like to say that this is very important work because now we know with big numbers, so big cohorts, that hypertension matters, that hypertension is a dangerous thing, that hypertension harms the patient and that the harms are myocardial injury, but also kidney injury. And, and maybe also cerebral injury. So this is this is great work, um, and, and and I'm very thankful for both the Cleveland Clinic Group and all the others uh, that have done this work, which is a foundation of our research. The only thing that I would like to remind us is that this is our population-based thresholds, so they are valid for big numbers of patients, but for your the individual patient that is just lying in front of you, these values might not apply. So we have to be a little bit careful by applying these general thresholds derived from population, big populations, to the individual level. So I think we still need to individualize those levels in our patient in front of us. Ashish explains more. So like I said, when we initially started this work, our idea was to take a patient through the entire perioperative journey from the operating room to either the ICU or the general care floor or both. Previous work that myself and others have done specific to the post-operative ICU has shown that hypotension associated harm in the post-operative ICU is dependent on intraoperative hypotension. So we could not separate intraoperative hypotension from hypotension in a post-operative ICU. I published that work in Critical Care Medicine 2019, and I worked over there because, you know, that work that I published basically showed that if you're hypotensive in the operating room and you're also hypotensive in the ICU, then you have organ system injury. But the risk of organ system injury is dependent on intraoperative hypotension. Well, we all know that, you know, our patients don't do well in the operating room. They come to the ICU, they continue to do badly, and they're going to have organ system injury. So this time, we wanted to look at the patient who did not have any intraoperative hypotension. Rock-solid patient intraoperatively comes to your ICU and now has new hypotension. Does that patient have a similar sort of risk associated with hypotension compared to the usual patient that, you know, bleeds a liter or so in the operating room, then comes to you in the ICU, right? The podcast is well worth listening to in full and links to it can be found in the show notes. So how do you go about setting up and then running a perioptive nutrition clinic? How do you convince patients and providers that this will increase value and efficacy? Is nutrition really an essential part of enhanced recovery after surgery? All these questions and more are addressed in our podcast, Nutrition Clinics, EPOM Chicago. Another hit on Top Med Talk from Evidence-Based Perioptive Medicines Conference in Chicago. Don't forget to check out epom.org now to find out about 2023. 
This was a lot of behind the scenes, just trying to figure out, do we need the nutrition optimization? Do we have enough patients? And the answer was overwhelmingly yes. Now, you may be in area and thinking to yourself, well, gosh, my hospital system, you know, we're just a small community hospital and we really don't have that many uh, surgeries per year that you may not have these numbers for patients at risk of malnutrition. So I would like to point out a couple different areas where you may be able to, to find additional individuals who are in need. One of those areas is diabetes. And in the 2021 standards of care from the American Diabetes Association, you can see that it is highlighted target range for glucose in the perioperative phase should be 80 to 180. This roughly translates to an A1C between a 7.5 and an 8.0%. So using this information, I went back to our patient schedule and just did a rough count of how many individuals might also need nutrition evaluation based on their A1C. Uh, I just counted up A1Cs that were available and for the month there was over 100 using that 80 percent and figuring out business days it did come down to about four individuals a day who have an a1c over 7.5 add that to the 12.6 who had a positive pond screen and now we're up to 16.6 patients a day who are in need of a nutrition intervention prior to surgery this podcast, Nutrition Clinics, is a didactic talk presented by licensed registered dietitian Elizabeth Villalta. This talk is complemented by a panel discussion, also linked to in the show notes of today's podcast. Also on TopMed Talk this year, we released the audio from the first transatlantic leadership forum, Connected Health, COVID Hyperdrive or Hype. Maybe hyperdrive is a little bit of hyperbole, but it certainly has ignited some sort of telemedicine and remote monitoring revolution. I think we'll look back in 10 years and say, wow, that's really when things ramped up and changed. Sam Ajizian there, CMO for Patient Monitoring and Vice President of Global Clinical Research and Medical Science for Patient Monitoring Respiratory Interventions at Medtronic. This piece is an engaging look at connected health. How are new technologies bringing world-class experts straight to patients, both safely, effectively, and at a scale that was previously unimaginable. It's presented by TopMed Talk's Desiree Chapel and our editor-in-chief Monty Mython and it asks the question, did COVID-19 put what's called connected care into hyperdrive? Yes, <laughs> yes is the answer. John Whittle, consultant anaesthetist, critical care physician and perioperative medicine physician and honorary associate professor of perioperative medicine at University College London. There's been a whole bunch of problems that have come as a result of COVID, you know, patient flow in the hospital, green, blue, red, whatever colours you want to call the pathways, full hospitals, full waiting lists, expanding waiting lists in our hospital and region. So I guess one of the main issues that we've had is how we can connect with our patients without their physical presence. So that's spread across a variety of spaces. So for example, pre-assessment, you know, moving to models of remote pre-assessment, uh, video links, etc. There's a prehabilitation service, for example, that we're setting up here UCLH, which is going to have to leverage technology really to reach our patients, to help engage them. So really this connected health concept is really accelerating plans that are had on the back burner, but are, um, are coming to the fore now. COVID has really enabled us to make connected health a reality. I think we all had aspirations five years ago, certainly. Imogen Fetcher-Jones, lead nurse for perioperative medicine and pre-assessment services at the University of Southampton Hospital. So I developed the surgery school at Southampton in the UK and we were running a face-to-face -face education session for patients pre-COVID and, and patients liked it and you know it was going really well but we knew it wasn't quite hitting the mark in that our attendance wasn't as good as it could have been and we knew that people were struggling to get to the hospital and the usual issues of parking etc and there also was a bit of a social demographic with that as well that concerned us but had COVID come along I'm, I don't know that we ever would have managed what we have in the last year in that we just 
totally flipped it online and are now delivering an intervention completely online, remotely to patients, mixed surgical bag. We've seen over 500 now in the last year. And the feedback we're getting from patients, it's blown me away to be honest, because I didn't expect it to be as popular as an online intervention as it is. But not only is it popular, our attendance has gone up and also more patients are reporting to us that they're intending to change their behaviour. So it actually appears to be more effective, which I never would have believed pre-COVID. So I'm totally for the hyperdrive. <laughs> Also featuring in the podcast, Betty Jo Ricoccio, CRNA and Senior Vice President and Chief Nursing Officer at Mercy Health in the US. We were fortunate enough in Mercy, we had a virtual hospital already before COVID started. But what it did for us is really amplify the role of nursing and physicians working together through that telehealth platform. And so we moved as much as we could into that platform and take advantage of not only pre-surgical visits, but post-surgical visits that couldn't occur in the doctor's office because while we shut down surgery for a very small time during COVID, we ramped up very quickly, but weren't quite ready to go straight back into the doctor's offices. So we move a ton of that work into that environment. So as well as connecting into our emergency department. So instead of admitting those COVID patients that could handle it, we sent them home with the appropriate therapies and the appropriate technology to be able to monitor them with COVID. So I think we're fortunate in the U.S. to be ahead of that curve and very fortunate in Mercy uh, because that platform already existed. We just literally threw it into hyperdrive um, to take advantage of the situation. And we have contributions from patient advocate Neil Johnson, chief executive of the Croy Heart and Stroke Centre the National Institute for Prevention and Cardiovascular Health and the Global Heart Hub in Ireland. I might answer this question from the from the Irish perspective and there's no question we all realize we're living in a consumer oriented health evolution and so connected health telemedicine all of that is here to stay for sure and it brings lots of benefits to both patient and clinician and to the health service you take COVID, and probably the biggest immediate impact would have been in the context of virtual consultations i remember hearing in the early days some of the cardiology specialists saying how fantastic it was they were able to now see four times more patients in their clinics and that's very well and that's good but it's not all rosy in the garden just because you're seeing four times more patients doesn't necessarily mean that you're delivering four times better care. And what is the experience like from the patient point of view? This was something that was foisted upon them rather suddenly. And again, in a West of Ireland uh, context, and you can draw the analogy to you know other parts of the world, we had uh, considerations like access, for example, to even mobile technology. Worse again, access to Wi-Fi. And then you have, given cardiovascular disease, predominantly a condition of the older population, not being used to having conversations with somebody like a clinician on a Zoom call or on, on our mobile phone. And then maybe relying on a son or a daughter to make that connection. And then the son or daughter is there in the room and you're having this conversation. And then you can't discuss certain things that you might want to discuss that are maybe sensitive or whatever. So uh, interestingly, what has come out of this for us as a patient organization here in Ireland, we've actually started to train patients uh, how to use technology and how to engage in those virtual consultations and how to get comfortable with the technology, practical issues like how to turn on the Zoom yeah. uh, call and, and, and get connected and then how to feel comfortable in that environment. So sure, it came at us like a runaway train. It brought about huge efficiencies in certain ways, like as I mentioned, the volume of appointments and so forth, but there's a lot of work still to be done. And from a patient point of view, a lot of consultation is required between patient and clinician to understand, are we really achieving what we need to achieve in this clinical relationship? Are you satisfied with this? You know, if you look at it from that point of view. So positive, but a lot of things are still to be considered. Links to this piece are of course in the show notes. And also, it's worth looking at the second Transatlantic Leadership Forum. It's called Is Day Case Total Knee Replacement Taking Eras Too Far? Ed Pom Chicago. Again, a link to this in the show notes. Equally popular in terms of downloads, it also deserves a bit of attention here. Chaired by Sol Aronson, Emeritus Professor at Duke University, and Desiree Chapel, Vice President of Clinical Quality at North Star Anesthesia, with various contributions, including David Howard, an honorary consultant, ear, nose and throat, head and neck 
surgeon the Imperial and UCLH NHS Trust Hospitals. He had his knee done. 11 weeks ago, I had the medial compartment of my left knee implanted here <laughs> in London. That's a very recent event. And if anybody would like to hear my views on the day case situation, I'm happy to tell you. He speaks about his experience as a patient. I was very happy to do it with a past knowledge of the benefits of day case surgery. My concern, I had excellent preoperative information, care, preoperative physio assessment, which was of the highest quality, superb information from the surgeon, plus some knowledge of my own, but that could have been given to me by the team. My one concern was my age and comorbidity, because when you're talking about the surgery, of course, you have to talk about the anaesthesia. And I knew that I was going to have a spinal anaesthetic, and my concern was borne out subsequently because I went into acute retention, despite superb care, early mobilisation, all the things that you can read about in the literature. And I'm sure Brian will fill us in on the joys of prilocaine and all the debate that goes on about 20% and 40% and all the rest of it. But the fact is that round about a quarter of people in my age group, male and female, um, run that risk of that comorbidity. And that one thing kept me in longer. And then with regard to the post-op, my wife is a professor of surgery. I knew she would collect me in a car where I wouldn't have to bend my knee a great deal. And she would look after me when I got home. So it's pre-op, peri-op and post-op. And that is always the case. So I've always felt that day case isn't, it's not a day case or I mean, you're basically one day, two days, three days doing joint replacement, and it, it depends on the patients. But I was very prepared to get out in one day. We also hear from Brian O'Donnell, consultant anaesthesiologist at Cork University Hospital. I will couch all of this by saying that specifically we are not currently um, looking to establish pathways within our immediate environs uh, for uh, ambulatory day case, either 23 hour or same day discharge knee arthroplasty surgery. Our current length of stay is about two and a half, three days at most, and our ERAS program is pretty much stretched to its limit uh, as it stands. I'm actually really interested because Vinode and his center have been doing this since 2013, so they're obviously doing something right if eight years later. Uh, they have a program that is discriminating between patients that probably should stay under the care of the inpatient environment for a window and a discriminator that would say, yeah, look, you know, that ambulatory care center down the road, we work there too. We manage that. We've got these same quality standards that apply there. You predictably will be that individual. I'm really interested to hear, not just to throw a question back, but I'm really interested to hear from Vinod as we, as we progress the conversation, what that discriminator actually is. And Vinod Dasa, VP for Academic Affairs, the Department of Orthopaedics, LSU. Right, Vin, what is an acceptable rate of unexpected extended or overnight admission? That's a tough question to ask. I don't think there's an appropriate rate or inappropriate rate. I think it's a, it's a function of a number of factors. Um, so it's not right or wrong to stay overnight or stay two days. If that's what you're, that's what you do, then that's what you do. What we're focusing on is readmission rates and rehospitalizations. That's really the, I think, the metric you want to look at. So if you're, and I'm just picking hypothetical numbers, you know, if you've got 100 patients leaving and 10 of them are bouncing back to the emergency room within one week because of pain or function or urinary retention or what have you, you know, that, that's a problem. Um, so that's really the, the metric I think people should focus on, not kind of what's an inappropriate length of stay. But we do know length of stay is linked with, you know, problems. So the longer your length of stay is, you know, we published a paper recently looking at length of stay and DVT rates. And so what we found was length of stay, I think uh, greater than three days uh, was uh, linked with statistically higher DVTs. Because if you think about it, if you're staying in the hospital, you're not moving. I mean, at least in our hospitals here, you're laying in bed probably for, I don't know, 18 hours a day. 
Uh, and then the rest, whereas if you're home, guess what? You're moving, you go into the kitchen, you're, you're in the living room, you're, you're doing stuff. And so, you know, laying in bed in the hospital, in my opinion, is, is really probably uh, more detrimental than uh, you actually being at home. Finally, for this podcast, we're going to be looking at another popular piece here on Top Med Talk. Released in May, it's called Perioptive Diabetes Management Nuts and Bolts. It's presented by Catherine evans Creda, Associate Clinical Professor at Duke University School of Nursing, Nurse Practitioner, the Division of Endocrinology, Metabolism and Nutrition at Duke University Medical Center. So I would encourage you, if you do not have something similar, that this is an excellent opportunity to improve your care pathways to help improve patient outcomes, and really to optimize care throughout the continuum of the perioperative period. This piece emphasizes the importance of perioperative glucose management and describes evidence-based approaches for perioperative management throughout. What about pre-admission? What are the best practices discharge? This piece is complemented by perioperative diabetes clinic panel discussion, which is also linked to in the show notes. That'll tell you how to set up and run your diabetes clinic. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget, of course, to subscribe. We have part two of Top Med Talk. Looking back, looking forward, coming up next week. And check out edpom.org, evidence-based perioperative medicine. The vast majority of Top Med Talk's content comes from evidence-based perioperative medicine, and we are its broadcasting arm. If you check out edpom.org now, you can find out about some of the exciting conferences that are being arranged in 2023.